Okay, good morning, everybody. Bill Lester here, and welcome to this week's virtual plant clinic. And I'm here today with my regular co-host, Lily Browning, our Florida Friendly Landscape Coordinator. Is it coordinator or? Pro program coordinator. You program coordinator, word. okay. A long title. <laughs> I always like to get the title correct. Yes, regular co-host is a good title too. Exactly. I was all by myself last week, wasn't I? You were. I had an, another meeting. Groundwater Guardian. That's another title of mine that, that I had to attend. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yeah, we had lots of questions last week. I know I went on for quite some time. I watched you. After it was over, I watched. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I kind of went through, but I skimmed through, but I watched <laughs> most of it. <laughs> Yeah, we had a lot of questions, uh, a lot of vegetable gardening questions. Of course, it is that time of year when people are switching over from your winter garden to your wow. spring garden. And if you don't hit that correctly, you're going to end up with a non, not very productive garden. So we can talk about that a little bit more today. Um, and, and that okay. reminds me, Buddy's saying hello, and that reminds me, I did see enough of it last week where you were still trying to guess if he was from Tallahassee or Pensacola, and it is Tallahassee. <laughs> exactly, Tallahassee. Well, I know they're not really close to each other, but they are both up in the same they're, area. They're north. Yeah, it's north is north. You know? <laughs> <laughs> they're, just, they're, they're, they're north, but they're not really northerners. So right. they're, they're that's north, okay. Northern Floridians. And Brenda's at work. Good morning, so are we? how are you? We're at work too. Yes, we are. Busy day, like always. Every day is a busy day. Uh, this evening, I'll be speaking with the Audubon Society on Zoom. If anybody is a member uh, on the diversity of Florida bees. Sounds very interesting. It is, and it's something that I don't really get to focus on or work with very often because keep in mind, most of the insect work I do is with problem insects. So if people have bugs in their house or bugs in their garden or maybe imaginary bugs on their plants, I have to explain, well, no, it's not a bug. It's a disease. It's a nutrient imbalance. It's pH. There's a lot of things that make your plants look bad other than bugs. It's not always a bug. And then trying to explain what kind of controls or steps you could take to get it under control safely without going nuclear, going out to your shed and pulling out the bottle of stuff that your grandfather left you that's been off the market for 20 years because it works really well. We don't want you to do that. But there's on Facebook, oh my gosh, there's so many wacky different concoctions. There's one I think I mentioned last week, and you may have not seen this, but a reference to a pest control that involves 409. You mentioned that to me, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, you have very clean insects. You'll have very clean plants too, and probably damaged leaf cuticle, the surface of the leaf that keeps the water and the pathogens and bacteria out and keeps all the plant parts in. You know, so we I can't think of any recommendation that we would give that involves 409 or any other household cleaners. So. Well, you're not going to give any recommendation for something that is not labeled as an insecticide. So, Exactly. We don't recommend any homemade concoctions that are that you are using as an insecticide that is not labeled as an insecticide. Or if you're using it completely outside of what it says to do on the label. Good example is mothballs. Mothballs are a pesticide and you could put them in your clothes, you can put your clothes in one of the plastic garment bags and put mothballs in to keep moths out. And I was thinking about that the other day. When's the last time you heard of anybody having their clothes damaged by clothes moths? Um, 1974. <laughs> yeah. Pretty much the same here. I, I have not seen that. I have not heard that. But I don't know. Maybe it still happens if you have what? 100% wool clothes. I was going to say, I don't think our clothes, I think our clothes are too synthetic now. We don't have no. that many natural fibers. 
that you know attract the moths or that however they got there i don't know if the eggs were in there like pantry pests you know just already there or or what you know and for anybody who's just recently moved here we'll share a little hint with you you probably don't ever really need wool dresses or suits here in central florida unless you're into self-torture <laughs> <laughs> Maybe three or four nights out of the year, you could put it on. So, you know, if you're outside, yeah, if you happen to be outside, I don't know how they did it a hundred years ago, everything being wool and well, 150 years ago, I should say. Yeah. Yeah. They had wool clothes and the undergarments and they'd be out there working in the hot sun in Florida because they just moved here from up north and didn't know that it gets really hot here for a good part of the year. And I mean, I guess the people, the natives had um, cotton that they wore, but um, still, I mean, you look at the Civil War uniforms and stuff, those were wool. <laughs> Well, Sid that she said that she had a problem with moss getting to uh, some of her um, 100%, I guess, 100% wool clothes. So it can happen, but that's the only... She lived in the middle of the forest, too. <laughs> yeah, that's the only instance where you should be using mothballs. You should never use them outdoors. They don't deter snakes. Don't throw them under your mobile home if you live in a mobile home because the fumes can come up through the floor and you just created a nice uh, gas chamber to live in, don't throw them up in your attic. And I spoke to a lady on the phone once before that somebody told her to do it and she did it. And she was wondering how to get the smell out of her house. I'm not sure how she ever did it or how that worked out, but we don't want you using mothballs for anything other than to protect your 100% cotton clothes. So Sid says that Moths and caterpillars can get into 100% cotton and damage them. Although but I, I haven't, moths. yeah, I haven't really. When I think of putting mothballs in closets and stuff, I think of, you know, gr our grandparents or something. You know, we haven't really known anyone since then <laughs> who's mm -hmm. done that. And they kind of did it out of habit. Because and people who had cedar closets up north, we had one when I was a kid growing up in Maryland. Yeah. We had a cedar chest. It was a, a little closet upstairs, kind of under the roof, so it had a curved roof on it, and it, the walls were made out of cedar. Right. And it was really cool. I don't have one here, and I really don't need one here in Florida. <laughs> um, I think we're also, our homes are much more energy efficient and tight, and we're just not, um, for good or bad, we don't come across as many household pests as we used to. I honestly don't see them very often. I haven't seen a pantry pest in quite some time. Oh, yeah, I've and seen that them. happens usually if you bring in something that got contaminated at the grocery store. Yeah. I, I got or, weevils once before from a bag of rice that came from the grocery store. And I was able to get rid get them out of our little pantry a gentleman came in with um, weevils in dog food that obviously he got from the grocery store, not from his home. But once you get them in your home, you need to get them out of there. So if you ever have that problem, contact us and we can identify it if you bring in a sample of the insect and tell you how to get rid of it. It's mostly throw clean all your stuff away and clean with bleach spray really, really well. In the cracks and everything. Yeah, I just ran across it recently, but it was up north in a well over 100-year-old house in January. You know, so the heat was on, and they were just never continuing problem. They were never able to find it, and I told them to be looking at their dog food. They hadn't done that, you know, even bird seed sometimes. Yeah, bird seed is a good way to bring insects in, so you want to keep the bird seed in a tight container, Outdoors, like on the back porch or in your shed or lanai or something like that. Did you see Janice's question about ants on her strawberries? Yes, I did. We actually were off of uh, clothes moths, I guess, and on the strawberries. So Janice says that her strawberries have ants eating them. Any recommendations? 
The reason why you have ants on there is because either the strawberries have gotten overripe and are starting to decay or something chewed on them and they're open and probably starting to decay. So obviously if any one of us took a ripe strawberry and took a bite out of it and took the other half and threw it on the ground outside, it's going to get ants pretty quick if you have ants in your yard. Most all of us do. So that's probably, the ants are probably not being a plant pest, so the ants are not directly damaging the strawberries or the plants. Now, if you have ants on a plant, it may be an indication that you have another insect problem because ants are attracted to things like aphids and mealybugs and scales and white flies because they like to drink the uh, sugary excrement or poop from those insects. <laughs> I was waiting for you to get around to that. <laughs> Honeydew. That's what it's called. Honeydew. Yeah. We're going to have to have a little challenge and see how many episodes we can somehow work the word insect poo into. I think you can work it into just about any, not even insect. We can talk about animal and, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> I think we've had entire episodes that kind of. Yes, we have. Really crappy episodes. Yes. <laughs> but yes, if you see ants on plants, you have to look very, very close because you may have another pest that's attracting the ants. But ants, unless some reason you might have a weird leaf cutter ant on your property that's chewing up the leaves, ants are not plant pests. But something nice and sugary and sweet and damaged or decaying or chewed on like a strawberry is going to be ringing the dinner bell for ants and they're going to come along and kind of finish it off. Strawberries so, are pretty much made of sugar. Pretty much, yeah. So Janice, I'm not sure exactly where in Florida you are. But strawberry season is going to be finishing up depending on where you live in the not too distant future. Even here um, in central Florida and Hernando County, um, I saw something on Facebook, j g Ranch, which is the local UPIC strawberry farm, which they have strawberries right now still for UPIC. They have blueberries coming up and then they'll have blackberries after that. They're having a special, if you buy two quarts, you get a quart free of strawberries. So they're getting the last great big flush of strawberries and really soon they're gonna be done. They're gonna have a lot of disease problems, a lot of insects. The strawberries are gonna get overripe really quick and they're gonna end the strawberry season. And then they'll be having you come out to pick blueberries, which is kind of next on the list of things to pick. So strawberries are going to be finishing up pretty soon here in Florida anyway. So enjoy them while you can. Go out there and try to get the last of the strawberries away from the birds and the ants and the squirrels and whatever else you might have living in your yard. And enjoy them while you can. They're just about to go. And Janice lives a little bit north of here in Crystal River. Um, so yeah, you're going to be finishing up soon, although you're not done yet. You're probably kind of getting the last burst or the last hurrah of strawberries right about now. But really soon, I think it's going to be getting hot and sunny and things like strawberries and all those different winter vegetable crops are going to very, very quickly decline. Uh, so she said, any pesticides if poop attraction is an issue? Um, really, you're not trying to eliminate the insect poop, you're trying to eliminate the insects. So you need to probably get a hand lens or magnifying glass, or if you look online and you want to buy one, it's called a jeweler's loop, L-O-U-P-E. And you can pick up one for a couple dollars. And you just need like 10 or 15 X magnification. That's good enough for me to be able to tell what a tiny insect on a leaf looks like if you use your hand lens and get up nice and close and get a look. But if you have something like aphids or mealybugs or scales or white flies, all of those are very easily controlled with just insecticidal soap. You're probably going to have to spray more than once. Read the label to see how often or how long you have to wait between sprays and spray a couple times. And those small insects are pretty easy to knock down. They're, they're difficult to get rid of 100% and keep them away forever. So you're always going to have to keep a close eye on them, but they're very easy if they're to the point where they're damaging your plants or attracting a lot of ants 
to knock them down and get the numbers back down really low so they're not damaging your harvest or your crop. The ants that are attracted to this honeydew, the sugary secretions, um, they farm it, mm -hmm. you know, and so they will actually defend the um, white flies or the aphids or whatever that's producing it against other predators like it's, you know, their livestock <laughs> that is producing their food. It's really kind of cool how that happens in the insect world. Yeah, they even have some pretty amazing videos if you look online of aphids that are being protected by ants and the ants will wave off the uh, little parasitoid wasps that are trying to land on the aphid and put an egg in it. Wow. So you have an aphid and a wasp that's the size of the aphid trying to land on it and the ant snapping at it and chasing it away and you have this whole little battle going on. That is cool, yes. So I just thought of something. This is a northern question, though. Okay. Were there aphids? Were there aphids or something um, on peonies? It seemed like peonies are always covered in ants. <laughs> or they were it in the seventies when I was little. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because there are parts of a plant that are going to attract ants anyway, because ants provide a certain amount of pest control for plants, also. If you have a problem with thrips on your plant, ants will gobble up thrips, lots of them. So plants will actually, they make the nectar, you know, in the flowers, obviously, which attracts bees and other pollinators, but that can attract ants also to come in there and get the nectar. And plants have other, um, can't remember the exact term, but other parts of it, usually right around the, um, leaf attachment where a leaf attaches to the stem where it excretes a sugary substance also because the plant is trying to attract ants to hang out on it okay. to help protect it from other pest insects so you have all these different complicated relationships between insects and their predators and the ants that are raising them and the plants that are trying to attract something and deter something else and the more you understand of that, the less you're going to be in a hurry to go and solve things with spraying when you go outdoors and look at your plants and kind of figure out, oh, well, I have aphids, but I have ladybugs and I have, you know, some ants and I have this and that. I know with myself, I always wait until things get really out of control in one direction or another where I have to intervene. I'm not just because I see things going on, I don't instantly think, oh, I have to get in the middle of this and control things. And I mean, if the ants are on your plants, you have ants in your plants, um, <laughs> just wash them off before you wanna eat them or something. The last thing you wanna do is kill out our native ants because you're just going to invite more room for the invasive fire ants. One of the best ways of controlling the fire ants is our native ants that don't bite you taking up that niche. Now, remember a week or so ago, we did part two on bugs that bite, sting, or taste you, and I covered fire ants. Mm -hmm. Just a few hours later, I kept scratching and scratching and scratching on the top of my foot, and I looked. I don't even know where it came from. Maybe just when I walked to the mailbox, but... They're very vindictive because I got a heck of a fire ant bite <laughs> just from talking about them and the different ways of controlling them. <laughs> so. See, they're trying to get even. They, they, yes, exactly. But that's great. I guess everybody is watching and listening on to us online. So even the ants. Yeah, even the ants. <laughs> yes. I'll get that woman. <laughs> yes. But yeah, please don't think that every ant outdoors is a fire ant because they're not. We do have fire ants, but we have a lot of other species of ants, many of whom are native, some of whom are invasive. Um, and most, a lot of the times they really don't have to be controlled and not all ants can bite. Some of them have, and I know from identifying ants under a microscope to key them out to species, one of the first things you're looking at when identifying them is on their rear end, does it have a sting or not? And you look at the rear end and if it has a little 
sharp pointy sting, it goes under these groups. And if it doesn't have a sting, and about half of them don't have a sting, it goes down these other potential groups that it could be. So a lot of them, and a lot of them do some very uh, beneficial things. Harvester ants eat seeds. They eat weed seeds. So the weeds that are popping up in your lawn, making potentially 20,000 seeds per weed plant, these ants are gathering up those seeds and taking them down the hole and eating them. That's a good thing, you know, fewer weeds, fewer weed seeds, that's always a good thing. So a lot of ants can be beneficial and a lot of other ones are just a part of the environment. They're just there doing what they're supposed to be doing. And if they're not a direct danger to yourself or children or pets or something else, once again, you don't have to be in a huge rush to stick your nose in and try to control things. So a food source for some other beneficial insect. Exactly. So Janice, yeah, you can find insecticidal soap at a big box store or a lawn and garden center or even online. And you can buy it already pre-mixed in a spray bottle or you can get the concentrate and just buy, I, I just buy a one gallon pump sprayer. That's big enough for what I'm, you know, using it for. And follow the directions. It's a tablespoon or so per gallon of water. And one small bottle of concentrate will last you quite some time. And for many small insect pests, you really don't need anything stronger than insecticidal soap. It's going to work and be effective. So, yes, all the insects and how they interact outdoors are very interesting, or at least uh, yes. interesting. And since I guess we veered off and we're on the topic of ants now, <laughs> Russ is wondering what type of ants will destroy a dead piece of wood. Normally what you're going to find in a piece of wood or landscape timber or maybe a fallen tree trunk or something on your property is carpenter ants. And we do have Florida carpenter ants and they are native they're and they, they're big. There's a couple different species. Some of them are really big and some of them aren't quite as big. And they tend to be, if you look at them, they're kind of redder on one end and blacker on the other end. Not bright red, kind of a really dark red, but it's they're kind of multicolored. They're burnt umber. Burnt umber, thank you. <laughs> I'm not sure that's what I was searching for, but that works. <laughs> and carpenter ants are very, very common outdoors. They're gonna, they don't eat rotted wood. What they do is they nest in it. So if you get carpenter ants up in your house, up in the attic or somewhere else, they will chew out and dig out wood to make a nest in, but they're not as destructive as termites because termites will eat the wood and then they'll move on and they'll eat more wood and eat more wood and spread and take out, you know, beams and two by fours and timbers and everything else. Carpenter ants, you probably do not want to have them in your house. And there are some very good baits that work very well on them. If you have trailing carpenter ants and then carpenter ants usually once a year are going to swarm. And now you might have tons either inside your house or outside your house. You have all these flying ants pouring out of a little hole somewhere and nobody wants that. So ants are not direct damagers of structures. They're kind of secondary. You want to get rid dead, of them, yeah. but they're not nearly as bad as termites. And a dead piece of wood is probably going to have several different types of insects. Now, oh, I don't sure. know whether he's talking about a treated two by four or a log on the ground. Those are two different um, issues. Mm -hmm. But yeah, a log on the ground is going to have beetles and termites and ants and everything that can find a home there to help it break it down as part of, you know, its job in nature. Sure. Um, when trees fall in the woods or on the back of your property, um, there's a whole um, procession of different insects that come along to break it down. So let's say, for example, if you have a large piece of property, you have a pine tree way out back, it gets hit by lightning. Within 24 hours, uh, different beetles are going to smell that and lay their eggs in it. And you have the first set of beetles feeding on the dead pine tree. If a pine tree gets hit by lightning, it's probably dead and it's probably not going to come back. It may not look dead yet, but it's a goner. 
So the first set of Beatles comes. That's the ones before Ringo, right? Yes, the first set of Beatles before Ringo, then more <laughs> Beatles after Ringo, then the tree eventually falls, and you get termites. You get other Beatles that live underneath it. You have Beatles that eat the other things that are living in it. So you have predators that come along. You just have this whole string of different things that come along. And eventually what you end up with is completely broken down pine tree that's turned into beautiful compost that's on the forest floor for new baby pine trees to come up. And that is the circle of life right there if you want to start okay. breaking and this off. Now that you bring that up, yes, Dr. Lester, <laughs> Um, you, I'll let you answer Sid's question in a second. But since you brought up the circle of life, in April, we're going to have a series of classes. Um, yes, we will. On Tuesdays. On Tuesdays, right? Mm -hmm. uh, mostly, mostly Tuesdays. Rotted, recycled, and resurrected. 10 o'clock starting April 13th. Um, that's going to be digging into soil science. And then we're going to talk about Dr. Lester's the following week going to talk about the fungus among us. The following week, he'll be talking about beetles and other cleaning crews. Then we're going to take a week off and we'll be into May. So May 12th, I believe, which will be a Wednesday. I'm going to be wrapping it up with all with bringing it all back home and basically discussing how these ideas of accepting death that brings new life, you know, in, in nature, how to bring that into our landscape. I think that's going to be a cool, uh, fun series that we have going, going on. Well, since you mentioned that, let's just head over to Hernando Extension, all one word, dot com, where you can find out about all of our upcoming classes on basic home maintenance for new Florida homeowners. Um, a nice home there. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> my boss, Jim Davis is giving that one. Okay. So, see, Lily and I aren't the only two giving online classes here. A lot of people within our offices are so. All over the state too. And I spend a lot of time when I'm not giving classes and I am just doing paperwork or this and that. I have somebody else's class on. Yeah. Like, you know, cause I'm happy to learn as well or, and, and steal from them too. You know, <laughs> To bring it to you. <laughs> yes. Exactly. And next Tuesday, we have a great class, which we already have a bunch of people signed up for, on sweet potatoes, which grow just great here. They grow surprisingly well. And I have um, somebody else with extension, Dr. Wendy Mussolini, who's a multi-county agent over on the eastern side of the state, who's actually working with growers over there to grow sweet potatoes commercially to make it a new commercial for-profit crop. And I thought that she would be the best person to teach homeowners how to go about uh, growing sweet potatoes, how to be successful with them. So that's, that's coming up on Tuesday. Go ahead and register for that. I love sweet potato fries in ranch dressing. <laughs> I like sweet potato fries. You know, I grew sweet potatoes once before and I got a ton of them. They grew great and I had pretty much no problems. Oh, look, we're going to have another class on invasive tegu lizards, my new favorite invasive animal, because it's a lizard that gets four feet long. And we have I'm them telling you, when up. the day comes that I step out my door and one of those are out in my yard, I am going to just flip out. <laughs> I think my dogs dream at night about encountering something like that in the backyard. Oh, boy, look, guys, it's a huge four foot long lizard. Yeah, my dogs, my dogs will be snacks for something like that. Oh, There's... my dogs would work as a team and they would, I might have to pay for stitches at the uh, emergency vet clinic, but they'd win. Yep, here's where we start um, that series, Digging into Soil Science. You know, when you can't find a good picture on, you know, that you can use, it's from UF or whatever without getting into trouble. Uh -huh. You just go make your own picture. That's what I did. <laughs> That That's the easiest. Yes. And then the fungus among us. Exactly, because fungi are something that people don't think about. They do a lot of decomposing outdoors. Very important. Mm -hmm. Green bear worship. 
<laughs> and then there's the Beatles. <laughs> yeah, yes. well, we talked about Beatles and how they help to decompose things and um, help to deal with dead trees, stressed trees, sickly trees. We do have a lot of invasive ones here, but we have a lot of native ones that are an important part of the ecosystem to help keep everything properly under control. And then I think you have a bringing it all back home. We went from the Beatles, so to, Dylan. We went from the Beatles to Dylan in this series. <laughs> so. Brenda says I can steal any of her pictures anytime. So that's good. <laughs> She takes a lot of really good pictures at the uh, friend nursery, request so. coming soon, Brent. <laughs> <laughs> she takes good pictures. That's great. Jim Davis, his photos are amazing. He takes. Yeah, he's he's a, a um, hobbyist photographer, and he just got himself a really a nice camera and some really nice lenses. So yeah. he takes all of his own pictures. I need to. We need to swipe some from him, I guess. <laughs> so Cindy asks a really good question. Those classes sound great. Will they be on Facebook Live? I couldn't get on the Zoom class about biting insects. I think it was because of my phone. Zoom can be a little twitchy on phones. You have to download it correctly and your phone has to play well with Zoom. So Lily, will those classes all be back on Facebook? Um, they will not be on Facebook Live. They will be on Facebook recorded. Um, yeah, the same afternoon that we offer them, as soon as, you know, Zoom does its thing in recording them, and then I try to put it on Facebook. Yesterday, it took a little longer, so it wasn't there till like, 3 or 4 in the afternoon, and that was just Facebook being slow. But it's always going to be there, and eventually, um, it all my classes will also be on Hernando County Government YouTube if you go and look now, you'll see a whole bunch of classes on there. Um, that takes a little bit longer because all I do is provide, you know, the MP4 to Hernando County Public Information, and they kind of clean it all up and put it on YouTube for me. So for those who don't like Facebook, tell them go to YouTube. Most people are okay with YouTube, you know, and um, that is also where you will find my classes closed captioned is on YouTube. So it'll be a little bit, you know, yeah, you know, later than when I actually give them, but they're they're available both of those ways. The day I give them, they'll be um, on Facebook recorded the, that afternoon. And then within a week or so, they'll be on YouTube. And then after you put them on Facebook, we share them on our Facebook page also. So they'll be back on our Facebook page too, if you're on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And I usually pin the latest one to the top of my page so you can find it. And if you're ever confused or wondering, just contact either myself or Lily and we'll send you the link, you know, of the video after it gets put right, on right, our, right. our YouTube or the county's YouTube. We, we, I mean, we try to put them in as many different places as we can to make them easily available to everybody, whether you're on Facebook or not. So, oh, um, Sid had asked, yeah, if carpenter yeah. ants bite people. Yeah, they'll bite. <laughs> carpenter ants bite people, but they're not like fire ants because fire ants, even if you're walking through your yard, they'll jump on your shoe and crawl up your leg and bite the heck out of you. Carpenter ants don't usually pounce you like that. Although, if you were you to, have to aggravate your hand, and start poking at it, my guess is it's going to bite the heck out of you. Yeah, and it hurts too. But yeah, you have to aggravate them. But, you know, if they're yeah. in a pot of yours or something, you accidentally run across them, you're going to get some bites. But they're not just looking for people to bite <laughs> like the fire ants seem to be. Yeah, if you're working in your garden, you accidentally put your hand in a bunch of them and get them on your hands. That's really, I mean, I've never gotten a bunch on my hands, but I, I've always been able to knock them off before they bite me. Right. But I mean, technically they could bite you. It'd be like a horsefly bite, basically. And Cindy says that she has some catching up to do with all of our videos, which is great. Um, 
Yeah, if you go to either our Facebook page, you know, Hernando County Extensions Facebook page or Lily's, you're going to find lots and lots of videos there. And um, on them, I'm going to be mentioning, if you want a PDF copy of this PowerPoint, you know, to email me. So don't think because it's not live, you can't do that. Just go ahead and email me. Just tell me which one you watched <laughs> and I'll be glad to send you the PDF so that you have some of the things in writing that are on the um, on the PowerPoint. And there is my email. There's Lily's long email. I'm telling you, Miss Be Glad Browning is not <laughs> included in it. <laughs> I've seen longer emails and then the people with FDAX, they quit doing it. They must've switched email systems, but when they always had fresh, fresh from Florida. Florida .com, yeah. yeah. Well, that was a campaign. Yeah. That was a lot to type in. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so if you guys have any other lawn and garden or plant questions or cedar closet questions or <laughs> anything else you want to ask, just go ahead and jump right in here. I have a story to share with you. Sure. Um, Tuesday, I had the day off. I was doing some errands, got, got myself shot, um, <laughs> and had some other errands to do. But in, in between, I was outside taking pictures of the different weeds, you know, which are wildflowers. And then all of a sudden, I was really excited looking at the neighbors, and I'm on my knees with my camera. And I said, you know, Oh, look, I asked him, I said, you planted ryegrass? And he's like, yeah. I said, look at all this blue-eyed grass that came up with it, which is all are these very small blue, one of the blue flowers of spring, you know, flowers that come up now. <laughs> Must have been in his ryegrass seed. Blue-eyed grass is not a grass, it's an orchid. Nor does it have blue eyes, it has blue petals and yellow eyes. But I was so excited about it, and he was like, Okay, yeah, they put a weed in my <laughs> rye grass. And he promised uh, when he mowed it the next day that he was going to blow them all my way. <laughs> <laughs> but I see he left me a little piece, too. <laughs> so, um, but I also got into an interesting conversation <laughs> um, that um, about the flocks, P-H-L-O-X, mm -hmm. that are on the... Uh, Roadsides, all the beautiful pink and purple flowers. Uh huh. He's not gonna come. <laughs> um, that um, he thought they were invasive. No. It, yeah, because in Michigan, there's a purple flower that covers the roadsides, and they're 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 all taught there that that's an invasive species. So I guess they move here and think that our flocks are also part of an invasive species. And they're actually, as you know, part of the Lady Bear Johnson wildflower program, you know, uh -oh. for, for the roadsides. They're not necessarily native. They are, um, there are some natives mixed in there, but they're, they're a Texas kind of flower. But they're still fantastic and wonderful. Yes, and they are beautiful. But it's yep. just interesting to me that we have such misconceptions uh, that people, you know, who may grow flowers that are actually invasive, but yet think that perfectly nice, wonderful flowers are a weed and a problem. So I thought found that pretty interesting. Yeah, and there you we have problems with invasive plants and insects and animals and everything else across the country. But especially with plants, you're going to have very different invasives up north in Michigan than you have in California, than you have in New York, than you have in Florida. Sometimes because of the range of environments that those plants can live in, they're going to spread quite a bit. Uh, invasive insects tend to be a little bit more tolerant of different con conditions. They can spread over a good part of the country from north to south. But it's going to be very different. So I wouldn't move to Michigan and think for one moment that I can identify much of anything up there because it's probably very, very right. different. Right. Everything they have outside their front door than what we have outside our front door here. Yes, but the assumption was because that what they were taught up north, 
that this beautiful wildflower that we have this time of year is is a weed and it's a problem <laughs> no it's not a problem it's there on they put the seeds there it's there on purpose it's it's what i one of the things i look forward to every year and they are they seem extra beautiful this year mm -hmm. and brenda's got blue eye grass in her yard great so it, it does well here uh -huh. oh yes a cute little flower it really is cute and let's go up to the question that we always get for a while this time of year about the black crickets which are called lubber grasshoppers uh they're small right now they come back every year yes they do they hatch in this area second week of march plus or minus besides just killing them can i spray something like soapy water on green leafy plants I would dump the actual grasshoppers into a bucket of soapy water rather than putting it on your plant. Yeah, because the problem is nowadays, a lot of the soaps that you might have in your house are really detergents. And if you spray them on your plants, it's going to um, degrade or burn through the cuticle or the natural waxy coating that your plants leaves have on the outside and could damage your plants that way. Doesn't damage every plant, but yeah, there's a chance that soapy water is going to damage your plants. And lover grasshoppers love to eat, and they will gobble up amaryllis bulbs, crinum lily bulbs, any other kind of bulb plants that you have. They like them the best. They really do love bulbs, yes. Yeah, they could be a problem on small citrus trees. You generally don't see them on larger, mature citrus trees, but a little new citrus tree. They can, like, defoliate it, eat all the leaves. But you may see a lot of them in your yard, and they're really not eating much of anything. I can go in my front yard, and I see them in the grass. They're not eating the grass. I have a holly hedge right out front, and if they're eating it, I can't find any damage. I don't see any missing leaves or chewed up leaves. I'm not really sure what they're eating, but every spring I have them out there. Yeah, me too, and, then, and I don't treat them. I don't treat them either. If let's say if I had a big patch of amaryllis bulbs out front, yeah, I'd have to do something to get rid of them. They, they'd strip them all the way down to the ground. Right. Or daylilies or something like that. Daylilies, they could be a problem with also any kind of bulb plant, but I have never personally ha seen them eat anything else. I mean, they might they, taste it, take a bite here and there, but they don't disseminate. Yeah. And then, and you don't want to make the mistake of, walking outside and you see your hibiscus and there's a problem with your hibiscus and you turn around and you look and there's a grasshopper on the ground it's like oh that grasshopper is causing that problem it might be but you need to identify what the problem is with your hibiscus look the plant over very closely turn over leaves get a hand lens because the problem might be really really small and you can't see it um and track down what the problem is before you go blaming anybody in particular. All, in all insects are presumed innocent until proven guilty. <laughs> we, need, we need to uh, start that campaign, huh? <laughs> and Carl says that they're eating his philodendron, and that could very well be, I've never had a philodendron here in the yard before, so I'm not sure. There's, this is, philodendrons are so tough, though. I mean, I, I unless it's a baby one, I would see it coming back from, you know, having a little haircut. And it depends on how much damage they're doing. Right. And Diana says they like crying flowers too. Yes, they, they do. do. Like I knew there was, stories. there was a plant I was missing and that's, that was it. Yeah. And Brenda points out that roaches are not innocent. They are uh, I agree. I agree with that one. Okay. <laughs> They are a natural part of the environment out in the forest. And most of them don't want to live in your house. They want to live outside. They can live outside. Unless they featured you on the show Hoarders and your house is stuffed full of old newspapers and magazines from 20 years. Then maybe they want to live in your house. But most well, houses, they don't want to live in. Condos, apartments, shared walls. Sometimes, they're, you know, you get an infestation you can't do anything about because of the neighbors or, you know, yeah, your, your neighbor was on hoarders and, 
And I, I, you know, I had a situation when I'm sure many, many people have where, you know, kids move back in and, you know, they had been in apartments. Mm -hmm. So actually all their boxes and stuff brought some roaches. But if you get on it right away, you know, I didn't let it become a problem in the house as long as you stay on it right away. So. <clears throat> Yeah, and you always need to be careful if you ever buy a piece of used furniture or used appliance, or if you're moving strange cardboard boxes from somebody else's house, a storage unit, anything like that, all of them potentially could have insects in them that now you brought into your house and now you may potentially have them. So. And speaking of such things, you and I were discussing um, earlier or a week or so ago, that what we we see on a lot of these Facebook groups, you know, people move back into an or they move into a neighborhood in Florida and they start asking immediately, where should I get pest control? Because word's gotten down the line that you move into Florida, you know, you get your CO, you get your water turned on and then you start your pest control. Like it's just that kind of and you and I have never had we well, haven't had any pest control in 25, 30 years living in Florida or, you know, no. longer. It is not an absolute necessity because you live in Florida to have pest control. I don't have a roach problem. Don't have an ant problem. Um, sometimes because of where I live, we do get scorpions in the house. It's got to watch out, you know, for them. We have spiders. I don't care, you know, because <laughs> that might be my pest control or the spiders. You gonna put that link? Yes, I am. Here I'm putting a link to the upcoming sweet potato class. Yeah, well, what's, what's the that? difference between oh, a sweet potato oh, oh. and a yam? Wow. <laughs> Dr. That's Lester, what wait, well. If it's, yeah. if it's live, <laughs> if it's a live link, you should be able to click on it. If you go to our Facebook page, oh my goodness. Sorry, I didn't mean to put that there. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> I was trying to like, click on it. That's a big link, yeah. <laughs> write, write that down, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> we have suddenly become a class no, coding. <laughs> no, don't, don't try writing that down. If you go to our Facebook page, um, and look under uh, events, it's in there. Anyway, so what's the difference between a sweet potato and a yam? A yam is a tropical vegetable, and it is going to be in a different plant family than sweet potatoes. Because the yam family is the... I'm not sure if it's the same as the lily family or not. But like, for example, air potatoes are technically a yam. They're in that family or that group of plants. Sweet potatoes are in a different family of plants. They both have edible tubers. There's a lot of other plants that make edible tubers also. Regular potatoes are in the Solanaceae, the tomato family. And they Deadly have nightshade family. Tubers. Oh. Yeah, the, the nightshade family. But uh, sweet potatoes grow very, very easily and very well here in Florida. And they'll grow through the summer. Yes, one of the few things that you can plant now and just have it grow all summer long. They don't mind the heat, the rain. Give them a lot of room to grow because those vines will spread and spread and spread. So you need to keep that in mind. Don't plant them in a little tiny spot and think they're going to stay there. They're going to spread. Let them grow all summer long. In the fall, anywhere between Halloween and Thanksgiving, you can start feeling around the base of the plants and you'll feel the sweet potato tubers or roots down there. And when you feel that they're big enough, you can dig them up. You can reach around and pull them up or dig them up a little bit at a time. Because keep in mind, if you harvest all your sweet potatoes all at once, you have a lot of sweet potatoes. You can dry them and they'll keep on your countertop for quite some time. I had mine lasted a few months on the kitchen countertop. I didn't have any problems with them going bad. And I got quite a few of them. Mine turned out great. Yes, 
Yes, and yam, like Sid says, yam is a common name for some plant species in the genus Dioscorea, which, which is what air potato is in. Yeah. So they form, form tubers. Yeah, air potato does not form edible to. I guess it's technically edible, it's just not palatable. Exactly. And I believe it's, Sid was involved with some of the experiments where they tried everything they could to make it palatable and just couldn't find anything to do to it to want to make it, you know, anyone want to eat it. <laughs> so, yeah, they did look at that. It's like, surely we could find a use for it. And they really couldn't. And the funny thing is, I believe it's the same species over in Africa. Certain varieties do have are they are edible yeah yeah they have uh, that um conjo root or something like that yeah yeah but the ones here all the ones in the u.s are not edible so we don't recommend animals animals don't even want to eat them hence their um invasiveness and sweet potatoes okay. in the morning glory family yes. sweet potatoes are in the morning glory family ipomoea See, usually we have Teresa on here who's kind of on really quick. It's she, doing a great job. <laughs> it's so hard for me to run things. And <laughs> yeah. um, Sid said she tried once and it was bitter. Yeah, it's very alkaline. <laughs> so yeah. it's, it's bitter. It's not yeah, they, specifically they, poisonous. You're not going to fall over dead. It just tastes absolutely horrible. Right. She tried to make yeah. scalloped potatoes. Probably. Right, and I believe there were others involved who are involved in a lot of those like um, edible plant classes, and they tried. They really tried to make the air potatoes all these different ways, you know, edible, and then they just were not successful. Just so. goes to show that edible does not mean tasty. Right. Something in the woods may be edible, and it may taste absolutely horrible. But if you ever find yourself on one of those shows where they drop you off in the woods and you have to survive for 30 days. I don't know. You know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Maybe if you eat a lot of them, it is harmful. I don't know. My guess is, yeah, it would probably make you sick. Because there's a reason that nature has it taste so bad, usually. Yes, a lot of plants produce compounds that make them unpalatable for different various pests. That's why cucumbers have a gene in them that produce a bitter compound. And even now, if you're growing cucumbers in your garden, every once in a while you get either a cucumber or a plant and the cucumbers look just fine, but you eat them and it's like, oh, that's really, really bitter. That's a compound the plants make to deter insects from feeding on them. Yeah. But we, we don't like bitter cucumbers, so we bred that out of them. So all the varieties that you grow now in your garden or you buy at a grocery store, as a general rule, that gene is gone, but every once in a while it pops up and you'll get a, a stray plant or cucumber that's really bitter. Is that why pickles came to be? Is that why what? Pickles came to be. Because it no, that people pickle stuff to preserve it. Well, I know, but I mean, with the cucumbers, I thought maybe if they weren't tasty, so then they created pickles <laughs> out of it. That may mask the taste or it may just turn into a really nasty concoction because we use vinegar to preserve foods because it's very acidic and bacteria don't like that. And anything that you throw salt into, if you have a bacterial cell, salt will suck all the water out of it and it'll plasmalize, which means it shrinks up and dies. So that's why salt preserves stuff, vinegar preserves stuff. Heating kills the bacteria, and then if you can keep more bacteria from coming in, it stays safe. That's the the science, be, the general science behind canning. So even though we don't make salt beef anymore, we haven't since people went around on sailing ships. It worked. Kind so we of. have refrigerators now. Uh, that's why we have refrigerators. Yeah, you can still dehydrate things because bacteria do need moisture to survive, if you remember that from the composting classes. So if you dehydrate beef and make beef jerky and keep it dry and get it dry enough, you can preserve you know, beef that way. 
that's what I do with my herbs. I dry them and you have to get them really dry down to a really low moisture content, grind them up into a powder and you have the same kind of herbs that you buy at a grocery store, except a whole lot cheaper. So the old science still works. Mm -hmm. And Sid said that she just cut up three sweet potatoes, uh, the plant, the sweet potato um, uh, roots or tubers to plant along pasture fences. She loves the vines. Yeah, it turns into a very attractive vine. And they do have varieties that are uh, ornamental sweet potatoes that still get the vines and the leaves and they're different colors and very attractive, but they don't give you the sweet potato roots that you can eat. It's purely an ornamental. So even regular sweet potatoes, right, yeah. you're growing them. It's a very attractive vine. It fills up an area very quickly. It'll fill up a fence. Mm -hmm. So if anybody has any final questions, it looks like we're getting to about that time. We already covered mothballs, poo, and sweet potatoes. So I guess that's we and ants. A successful ants. day. Ants and lovers. Uh huh. Everybody's favorites, and we know that all these different springtime pests all show up at pretty much the same time. I guess really soon we'll be getting all the Jadera bug questions and the um, tussock moth caterpillars. Somebody posted on Facebook that they have them really bad, but they live way out in the country with a bunch of oak trees. So if you have a bunch of oak trees, you're going to have tussock moth caterpillars. You They're live in the right. right now. You just don't know it. Um, if you live actually in the city of Brooksville limits, not just if your address is Brooksville, but if you live over there east um, and they're in that oak hammock, you're going to have those toxic moths. Sure. You get them every year and some of are worse than others. It varies. So Susan wants to know where's the best place to buy sweet potato vines. If you look online uh, at different vegetable seed companies, you can buy the actual little, they call them sweet potato slips, the little shoot that you can plant. Or if you go to the grocery store and buy some sweet potatoes and let them sit around long enough, they're going to start sprouting. And you can cut those sprouts off and put them in water to get some roots on them and then plant them and start your own sweet potato slips that way. And Dan said the, the mouse and other animals browse the potatoes all over the property. Yeah, if you're trying to grow real potatoes or sweet potatoes, there are other animals that are actually going to, you know, eat that as a potential food product for them. And something that somebody pointed out before that I've never tried, Sue says that Africans saute the sweet potato leaves. Did you know the sweet potato leaves are edible? And some people like them very much, and they're very nutritious also. I never thought about it. Yep. And now, not, be careful with that because not the ornamental sweet potato vines. Don't yeah, go around it, eating it, those. It, it is actual real sweet potatoes. But if you know that it's real sweet potatoes, you plant it up. You started on planting them. You can eat the leaves during the summer. Uh, and then Filipino saute bell pepper leaves. Which I don't, I, that's the first I've ever heard of that. So I really can't recommend it, but I have to look into that. Yeah, all the stuff we throw away or compost. Exactly. And here's another update with another spring insect pest. Mikkel says the Eastern tent caterpillars have been light this year. I usually have a lot of them, and she lives in Northern Brooksville. So Those are like, things that people freak out about because they look pretty ugly, but they are the ignore type. Yes, you know. tent caterpillars don't go into a They're panic not. Before. They are not gypsy moths. Yeah, correct. They are not gypsy moth. They're the native eastern tent caterpillar. They come out in the spring, and if you get one up in your wild cherry tree or cherry laurel, that's kind of their favorites. Um Maybe um, some of the different native plum trees you'll see them in also. They'll eat a bunch of leaves off a branch or two. 
but because it's early spring what your tree does is it just regrows new leaves it has plenty of time it's got all summer long to get new leaves so unless you have a huge number of them there's really no control on a, on a very small tree too mm -hmm. what are you going to do about a 50 foot tree exactly and i've had people call before and they say i have 10 caterpillars up on my tree i'm 80 years old what do i spray it's like mm, i don't recommend that you climb up in that tree and spray anything and they said well do we need to get the tree cut down no <laughs> no it's just a small problem that the vast majority of trees are going to be able to grow through and it's not going to cause any major problems we've had people wanting to burn them out oh yeah and i'm not sure if we should even mention how you can use uh hairspray and a lighter to take care of <laughs> do not recommend that start a, if you want to start a forest fire or put your neighborhood on, on fire and if you think about that that's terrible on your tree also so that's <laughs> yeah well and and your neighborhood that you're going to burn down <laughs> exactly so if you guys want to once again Go to HernandoExtension.com and see all of our upcoming classes. Or if you'd like to give our office a call, Teresa is there today. She was out yesterday and we were all lost without her. Oh, no. And you could shoot me an email or you could shoot Lily an email. Otherwise, we are going to be back next week. And next week is going to be a really exciting show that everybody Oh, that's your April 1st one. Yeah. For, it is going to be the one year anniversary of our virtual plant clinic. And I'm going to invite back all the different people that have joined us and been kind of guests and guest hosts. And I wrote up a list and there's over 20 of them here. I need to email with a link and we'll see how many of them show up. Do you know that we can get 10 people on the screen all at once? Okay. I've never done it, but next week we're going to figure out and see if it actually does work. So we're going to have t 10 of us on the screen, and I think I can have two more in the waiting room. So if everybody shows up, we'll have quite a few people here. And just think about that. No matter what your question is, we will have an expert here that can answer it for you. So Room full of really smart people. Exactly. I think next week save all your really hard questions and i'm just going to read them and i'm going to let somebody else answer them because we're going to have you can leave me in the waiting room but if you want to. <laughs> we're going to have plant pathologists on here we're going to have doctor of plant medicine graduates we're going to have tree experts we are going to have water experts we are going to have uh livestock experts we're going to have maybe sea grant experts so if you want any good fishing tips or how to fillet a redfish or something like that we can answer your questions somebody here will be able to help with that so make sure you tune in next week it should be really exciting it should be a lot of fun too so. will there be cake maybe maybe i'll have to make a virtual cake i got <laughs> yes. god you just gave me an idea so <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll go out and order a one year anniversary cake and take a picture and go. I'll just, I'll, I'll screen share it for the whole time or I'll keep screen sharing it or something. All right. And then I'll be at your house right after for the cake. Okay. No, I'll figure out how to train a camera on it and it can be one <laughs> boxes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All great ideas for next week. So everybody, thank you so much for tuning in and hopefully we will see all of you and a whole bunch more here next Thursday morning at 10 a.m. Because we'll be back then. Okay, Bye, everyone. We'll see you Bye. next week.